super exciting to be here uh, and welcome Miki and, and Markus. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the journeys with uh, Walt and Bolt um, and expansion. So let's get straight into it. So uh, Miki, uh, Walt is now present in uh, 24 markets, but what was the first first country you expanded to after, after Finland? Yeah, I mean, the first country we went to was Sweden. Uh, the logic was very simple. Uh, it was a one-hour flight. And we kind of approached uh, expanding to the first country as a product development exercise. Like, we need to learn what it is like to operate in a new country with a new currency, language, culture, so forth. And we figured that the closer it's going to be, the easier it is for us to fix things and to learn things. Uh, and Markus Bolt is now present in uh, 45 markets. But what was the first first one? The first one for us was very similar logic was uh, Latvia and Riga because equally it was pretty much the closest city for us to go to. Uh, but that one actually went very similarly to Tallinn. So I think the uh, third one we tried to enter actually was Helsinki. Uh, and still eight years later we've been unable to expand to Helsinki because of the regulations here. So oftentimes choosing only by uh, proximity isn't the best idea. Sure. Um, the topic, topic of the title of, of this fireside is expanding in fringe markets. Um, how conscious has been the decision to uh, to Walt uh, to expand in this fringe fringe market? Yeah, I read this case study. Um, you know, this was already some time ago, where they said that you know one strategy you can take as a startup is to take a big market and then to go to these underserved like markets. Uh, and I was like. That's a really smart strategy. I, feel, I hope we had figured that one out. Like, you know, for us, how it went was that you know we expanded to our kind of uh, nearest countries as a starting point. So we're on, in all the Nordic countries, all the Baltic countries. Uh, and after that, because we were a small company and we were always in an industry that's massively funded, and we were always the underdog, so we need to be very conscious about where we expand so that we're able to kind of back the bets that we take. Um, and that meant that we chose markets that were not like the UKs or the, the USs or the, or the whatnots of the world, but like countries where we knew that we we're going to be able to invest what it takes to be able to you know, build strong positions and win these markets. Mm. How about you, Markus? How, how conscious has, has that strategy been for Bolt? Absolutely crucial. We, we literally would not exist here today without choosing that. So mm. for us as well, we raised the first tiny amount of like a million in funding and at first all the investors were saying you should go to these traditional markets which were usually the UK and the US but uh, for our sector that made zero sense whatsoever like there was all these existing players already there who had raised tens of millions hundreds of millions of funding uh, and actually we once thought the consumer problem there wasn't as big like we, we realized that in Eastern Europe we could actually deliver much more value with the original taxi hailing product uh, so, so that was the sort of competitive landscape. But the other one was that actually uh, what we realized was that by winning these uh, smaller markets, first of all, we could actually win them, get them to financially profitability sustainable level, and then use all of that funding and then expand into the Western markets afterwards. So what has actually happened is that all the players we thought were big, uh, five, six, eight years ago are now actually relatively small in comparison. So actually the dynamic has completely shifted. And that's something most investors didn't get. Mm. I think seven, eight years ago, the paradigm was that you need to go to these big markets because that's the only way how you can build a billion dollar company. That's not the case whatsoever. We, we realized a long time ago that uh, if you look at the GDP growth, population growth, mm. smartphone penetration and so on, then you can actually build a huge company, one of the biggest in the world, by never even going to the US, just by focusing on these markets. Mm. We have a lot of entrepreneurs in the, in the audience today, so what uh, advice would you get, uh, give to founders who are t thinking about the first markets they're, they're expanding to? What, 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 what would you th think about in the market, market pick model? Yeah, at least for us, our playbook was that at the start, expand to only one country at a time, because you're going to make so many mistakes that you don't want to be making those mistakes in five places at the same time. Like you expand to your country, you make mistakes, you learn. You expand to the second one, you make mistakes, you learn new things. Uh, and over time, you kind of develop a playbook of like how to do this. Like where do you find the right people? How do you launch? How do you get like in our, in our kind of case, like the right marketplace dynamics to work, the right selection supply, customer experience, speed, so forth. Uh, but I think like this kind of go slow at start to be able to go fast later is something that's a little bit counterintuitive. And especially like our investors uh, told us at the start, like we want to go fast and we have to go to the big markets <laughs> and let's go to, you know, 10 places at the same time. And, you know, that could have really killed the company, a company. And I think like uh, in hindsight, like we, we kind of realized quickly enough that no, we need to first figure out the scale playbook and only then go to, you know, more markets at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely the same case. I think we made the mistake that we raised the first million after we had been relatively successful in Tallinn and then we tried to launch four or five cities at once, being Latvia, Lithuania, Finland and so on, which are all relatively small markets, but even then we took on too much at once. And just the management team at the time was so small, we were still figuring stuff out, so we had really no idea what we were doing. So we burned most of that funding and we were like, okay, this fails, let's actually stop it, let's start to take it sequentially one by one, and that was the only right strategy to do looking back. Uh, so that's, of course, like one very important recommendation. The other one is that we were actually, I think, trying to get rid of the biases which we realized we had many uh, when we first started expansion. So what we then tried to do was we actually figured 10 parameters how we would rank a market. Uh, most of them are pretty straightforward, like uh, what, what's the population size and GDP and so on. And for us, one of the crucial points was regulation, because for the taxi industry, that's always been historically the biggest blocker. Uh, and then we made a table of a couple of hundred cities in the world. Where just, we were putting in all the cities, just whatever we thought, like, those could realistically at least be viable. Uh, and then we started to prioritize them, and then actually we realized all the African cities were top of the list. But we had zero experience in Africa. Most of us had even never even been there. Uh, and, but all the sort of data was showing us that it should be right. So we didn't even have any budget to fly there. Uh, I mean, we had basically not, nothing. We were a team of 10 people. So we were like, okay, let's try. So we hired a young university student uh, just fully remotely, had them on the ground and sort of started to, to test out the market. And you know, a year later, of course, we realized it was the best uh, market for us and it became the biggest, biggest city. Uh, but I think that was one of the big insights we had, that like, we had so much biases why it might not work, but actually when we started to look at the data, we discovered some completely new opportunities. That's very interesting, and I, I think that's um, something that also now changing uh, as as companies get more used to like remote work and 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 also building remote first companies uh, that uh, startups nowadays can uh, look at at expansion uh, through a different uh, different uh, lens. Um, Bolt, uh, Walt and Bolt uh, operate in fiercely competed uh, markets. Um, what advice do you have for founders? How, how to look uh, at competition? Uh, is there markets you should not uh, enter? Yeah, I think the, the first thing to say is that like, a lot of people might look at, like, for instance, Bolt or Walt as like, oh, the guys saw what some other company somewhere else was doing and they you know, did a copy of that and went to these markets before you know, the other company had the chance to do that. And uh, like, for instance, in our case, that was not the case. Like, when we founded Walt, there was not really a, like, a, like this kind of a restaurant food delivery industry. Like, there were some last month delivery companies that ended up going with the restaurant. And then there was companies like us that, for instance, started in the restaurant side and ended up on delivery. Uh, and our kind of ambition was always to build like the best product in the world, the best service in the world. That was always our aspiration since the start. And kind of the market selection ended up being something that many years later, as we were building the company, kind of was the natural thing to do, given the competitive dynamics and the landscape and so forth. But that was not really what we started off doing. And I think the important thing to take home is that, you know, you want to build a world-class product. You want to build a world-class service. You want to build something, because otherwise you're not going to be competitive in, in the long term. Uh, and then the other thing about it, about competition, is that ultimately this is not a competition against other companies doing doing similar things, it's the competition against the fridge. Mm -hmm. It's a competition against the corner grocery store. Like, that's the competition. And hence, like, you need to obsess and focus on the customer and building the best possible service for the customer. Like, companies like us are only as good as the last order people made. So you can lose a business in this industry uh, very, very quickly if you don't execute well. So as a result, like, you know, we've never really focused on our competition. We've always just focused on, uh, on, on the customer. And if we are able to build a service where we efficiently get customers, they recommend the service, retention is good, yield economics are good, frequency is good, you know, that's how you build a great business, not by you know, f obsessing on what the, the competitors are doing. Same, I think two points here. One is that, again, when we started in 2013, uh, there was really no ride-hailing company that was even working with private drivers back then. Mm. Uh, back then, our core sort of first major competitor was Uber, uh, which was actually started off as a very expensive, fancy limousine service. And when we started, that was the audience they were catering to. I started the company as a 19-year-old who was thinking that I need an affordable service I can use and I want to replace the private car. Still to this day, I don't have a driver's license. So sort of we came at like very, very different ends where they came from a very premium service. We wanted to make a service that's affordable for the masses to use on a daily basis. So, and that very much philosophy has carried with us today as well. Uh, another point is that, yes, these industries are huge. Some of the largest sectors there are, but they're also brutally competitive. So obviously, as a company, you need to be very mindful what's the right sequence of countries to go uh, to. If we had started to go to the most competitive markets in the beginning, we would have most likely failed. Yes, we were much more frugal than the rest. 
yes, we were getting many, many times more value for customers out of every euro we invested. But if the other player has 10 times more money to spend, it's still going to be extremely difficult. Mm. So we did the right choice of picking which are the cities that we are definitely going to offer the best service in, win those one by one, and only then go to these more competitive markets when actually as a company, as a product, we're ready to do it. Mm. Uh, so you've mentioned uh, the playbook. So when was the uh, point uh, you kind of found the recipe that works? Uh, when did the expansion become scalable uh, for you, Margus? Um, well, it uh, definitely took four or five years of just uh, iterating, a lot of failures. Um, and still to this day, we realize that markets have quite a lot of differences. So of course, Many things are the same. Uh, customers always want lower prices, faster speeds, uh, you know, more selection, whatnot. Like all of those are true and will continue to be true in 10 years. Uh, but how do you deliver that in each specific market can be very, very different. So what we try to find, uh, and I think what we do pretty well now, is have a good balance. So we, on one hand, take all the central learnings, and we have pretty good playbooks and. The same people, actually, who are running the first markets are still today running the, the core major businesses for us. So they've seen this play out in seven years. They know better than anyone how this is done, but they never get, the, they never get arrogant and try to force this global approach everywhere. But we hire really sharp people locally. We give them autonomy. And then this sort of hybrid and this combination is what results in the, in the best outcomes. Mm. What about you, Miki? Yeah, I still remember being given the advice that, you know, you have to build the playbook for expansion. And I was like, what does the playbook look like? I was like <laughs> physically thinking about the book in my mind. And I, I remember even asking like, uh, you know, someone who worked in another company that developed a playbook for expansion in another industry. And I was like, can you show me the book? Because I was like <laughs> physically thinking about like a playbook. But what playbook ultimately means is that it's almost like a list of things that you do to build up a market. And, you know, in our case, like, it's a list of, like, you know, some hundred-ish things where it starts with, you know, how do we, how, where do we find the office? Where do we hire the people? What are the different people, different roles in the team? Like, it's this list of activities and actions that you do to build up a market. And what developing the playbook basically means is that every launch that you do, you learn. You kind of learn that, oh, we hadn't figured about that, or actually this we should do in that way, or, oh, this is the best way to hire a marketing person in a country, uh, and so forth. And that's ultimately the playbook. And I think, you know, for us, uh, it was between 2016 when we launched our first country outside of Finland um, and then 2017 that uh, we basically developed the core of the playbook and then like uh, after that we were launching eight countries at the same time. Um, and that's when we kind of had iterated the playbook that, you know, we could do many, many places at the same time. Uh, but still today, like, we learn. We learn from launches and, you know, uh, we become better at doing this thing. And as, as Marcus said, it's a lot about sequencing, a lot about, because all of these kind of marketplace industries are about, you know, building a portfolio of markets where some markets you're going to be very strong in and you're going to have cash flow that you can take and invest to other markets. Then you're going to have up and coming markets and battlegrounds. And if you only have battlegrounds, you're not going to be able to build a very long, long term competitive company. So you need to be very mindful about like balancing the portfolio. If you're only, you know, in these battlegrounds where uh, where it's a nightmare of a competition and no one has a strong market position, it's going to be very expensive to build up a company. Mm. Um, what are some of your biggest learnings over the years? And if there's one thing or some things that you would do differently uh, when you look back five <laughs> plus years? Uh, dozens and dozens of things, uh, but uh, definitely the one that uh, we always keep in mind is that the big companies often do a lot of stupid shit. And, and to be honest, like we, we've seen this play out so many times. Like Everybody was looking from the outside that Uber is this big success story, whatever, they had been raising more funding than any other company before. But then when we started to zoom in how they were actually operating in these markets, we realized they were doing so many stupid things that we can actually outcompete and offer so much of a better customer experience. So, for example, one was when we were starting to launch these African countries on a super, super frugal budget. We literally couldn't even fly there. We were hiring people remotely back then when that was a weird thing to do. Um, and uh, we realized, for example, that we started off with cash payments and digital payments. Uh, and Uber back then was actually only enabling payments in credit cards in Africa, where like less than 5% of people have a credit card. And they were operating there for like a year or two. So it just you look at this and you're like, it's a whatever, $70 billion company. They apparently have super smart people. And then like they are just missing out like 90% of the market because of a simple thing as a payment method. And that's like the most obvious example. So when you start to look at like the details of it, they were doing just dozens and dozens of things wrong. So that gave us a lot of confidence as a company that let's start off from the first principles. Let's look at what the customer needs, work backwards and be more confident in us actually uh, and not just follow whatever these big companies apparently are doing. That's, that's almost never the right thing to do. 
Mm. Yeah, it's a very similar thing for us. I mean, just pay very close to the uh, to the customer. Mm. Like, you know, ever since we launched Vault in Helsinki, our first city, uh, when we've asked customers what do they want Vault to do, the number one most requested thing was, I want to get my groceries with the same experience. And we knew that basically since 2015. And we're always like asking ourselves, when is the right time and what is the right way to enable that? And nowadays we do that in virtually all of our countries. But we waited and focused on building a restaurant food delivery business basically for the first six years of our existence. So I think like, you know, your customers ultimately tell you in either ways that they say or either ways that they do what they want from the service. And I think, you know, just by following the customer, we had a very similar experience about cash and delivery. Like we expanded to markets like Greece and Croatia. And we saw that this was a thing that was culturally very important. We went to Israel and one of the most common pieces of feedback we got was that Volt is an amazing service, but why do I need to have cash to tip? Because our team was so against tipping from a, like an ideological point of view. So you just have to listen to the customer and you learn about like what you should do as a company. Also, when you expand, you know, we always try to understand customers in the market we are evaluating for expansion. Like, are we building something? Are we doing something that could produce value in this market uh, in a way that no one is really truly doing, uh, you know, yet? Mm. Uh, I want to talk about uh, talent and culture for a bit. Uh, when you're hiring that uh, first person to your new market, what what do you look for in 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 that person? Mikkel. Yeah, this is perhaps the most important part of the playbook, at least for us, because what are companies? Companies are a compilation of people working towards a common goal. Um, and when you go to a new country, no one has heard of your company, especially like in the early days when we've raised like, you know, two million or 10 million of uh, funding, like no one had ever heard of Walt. Restaurant food delivery as a starting point was not a very like sexy thing to be doing. Uh, and we go to a country where like, you know, we need to teach people about the opportunity, the industry, the company, what we do, and to actually be able to hire good people. And you know, we just became very good at hunting people. Like the amount of hacking LinkedIn that our company has done over the years has been, uh, you know, insane. And you know, it's about you know finding candidates, you know, without having any applications. Like we have never been a company that waits for applications. You know, we want need to hire an operations manager in country X. You know, we know what good operations managers look like. We shortlist 60, 70 people. We reach out to them. We get them for coffee. We tell them about the company, what we're doing. We get them excited, and then we have an opportunity to understand which one of these people could be the right person for us. And that's really when the recruiting process starts. But like, we didn't wait for any applications. We went out to you know find the people that we need. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Two points to add here. I think one is that investing in, in recruiting when you start to scale is absolutely core. Uh, we got very lucky that among the first 30 employees, we, we got the best recruiter I've ever seen in my life who's built up our entire recruiting by, by until now. And it's probably one of the only reasons why we've been able to scale this quickly. So really just getting these extremely sharp people who are like know how to find talent, they aggressively hunt them, not just wait aggressively for people to apply. Like That, that makes no sense in this talent environment uh, is absolutely core. Yeah. And the other one is that we've always been much more focused on the actual intrinsic abilities of the person. How talented they are, how hardworking they are, are they high integrity and so on, and not get misleading uh, sort of info from the CV. Like sure, they might have been working in some awesome company like Google, uh, but what we've realized over the years is actually those companies have a very different culture than what we need. This is a very brutal operational business. This is not some like only software business that you can build in Silicon Valley. You need great technology and you need great operations on the ground. And that actually requires a very different kind of person. So it's not like you can just go and hire from these like cool brand name US companies and think those people are going to work out. Oftentimes they don't. Mm. Um, I think this is something a lot of founders are thinking about when they are uh, launching their their first markets and hiring hiring the first uh, people to join the team. So, how do you convince people to join when when people have never heard of of Bolt or Walt? <laughs> Um, well, actually, in some cases, we've on purpose been uh, actually warning candidates up front that this is not going to be an easy ride. Uh, this is one of the most competitive sectors the technology world has ever seen. Uh, in fact, no competitor has raised more funding than, than Uber. I mean, they raised more than 20 billion and we've both had to face against them with an order of magnitude less funding. Um, and uh, that actually works, I, I think, extremely well. So on one hand, it sort of filters out the candidates who don't want that kind of environment. They want something more relaxing. But on the other hand, it does really excite and, get, and attract you the people who want to compete in the toughest league and the sort of uh, for the biggest prize there is. Um, and I think that's actually worked really well for us to be very transparent about what's the challenge up front and not try to make it seem like uh, we're a company we're not. Yeah, great people attract other great people. 
Like we've had so many of our people join Walt because like, you know, we expanded to a new country and our lead launcher for the market uh, was able to get people excited about what we can build or other people in our company. Like when we hire, for instance, a general manager as Walt, we usually use other general managers from other markets as part of the recruiting process because we're at the same time trying to raise the bar of what it is like to be a general manager at Walt. So we're not just thinking about a general manager for this market, but we're thinking about the general manager community and how does this person make the community better. So it's using the peers, uh, you know, from different markets also also as help. And you know, when you look at engineers and product people, like everyone wants to work with smart people on difficult problems uh, and to build something with an impact. So I think in our case, it's been about like you know the people that we have that bring more people like them, and about the problems we solve, the quality of product that we build, and the opportunity that we have as a company. And ultimately, like you know, hiring people as an early stage company is exactly like raising funding. Like you are selling people on what we can build together. It's not that what we've done so far; it's about what we can do from here on. Exactly. Um, you both now are present in dozens of, of countries. Um, do you have one company culture or does that question even make sense? <laughs> uh, well, there's definitely some elements that are shared. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of how we look for people, what are the traits we, we care about, uh, how we operate on a daily basis, all of that we have actually over time invested more and more to document it and make sure that everybody's on the same page, what are the commonalities. But on the other hand, of course, each country and each team even will, will have a bit of a nuance, depending on what is actually is the, is the function, is the country's needs and so on. And we allow a bit of the country managers to have a bit of freedom in like what kind of people they attract. Uh, so I think you just need to find a good balance there. Uh, you can't really find like define a too narrow box, otherwise you're just limiting yourself from the wider talent pool as well. Can you uh, give me an example of something that is shared, uh, something that's so important to you that is shared across markets? Uh, well, one of the core ones is, is again, that uh, we look at uh, talent over CVs. So that, that's something that we always universally just uh, constantly remind people always when we look at hiring, that look at like how hardworking is the person, are they a good team player, are they actually super smart as a learner, can they adapt to this new industry, not just get overly focused that, you know, have they done this particular thing before? Because what we see is that some of the best people, some of the best managers in the company have started off at much lower junior uh, roles before. They actually didn't have prior experience, but they were just so talented, so hardworking that in six, 12, whatever months, they managed to actually grow into that role and beat others who supposedly had much more experience. Mm -hmm. So that's, for example, something we really hold true across the company until now. Yeah, I, I remember when we had like uh, our, our previous offsite before COVID. We were 500 people at the time, now we're four and a half thousand people. Uh, but I remember being super nervous about bringing everyone together into the same place because you know we'd hired out of those 500 people around like 400 in the last 12 months uh, at the time. And I remember coming together with the team and like being so positively taken by the fact how similar the team felt. Like it felt like family coming together. People had never met each other across different countries. They'd interacted like online, uh, but you had this similar vibe to the people. And I think that's what culture ultimately is about. Do you have people that have a sh similar philosophy uh, about you know, work, about you know, what they want to do, about what kind of pride they do in work, what kind of work ethic they have and so forth. And I think when it comes to culture, there's always like subculture. But like you want 80% of your culture to be very similar. Like in our case, like, you know, it's very sim similar. Like we think that attitude oftentimes beats experience. You need experience in a lot of things, but like a great attitude, a great ability to learn and, to, and the curiosity you know, usually makes you a lot stronger in the long term. Or we have people that really care about the work that they do. We talk a lot about doing like common things uncommonly well, about like wanting to achieve excellence, wanting to build for the world class, wanting to have the best service uh, possible, both in product and operations. So these are the things that like form up a culture. And ultimately, those are the important things that you need to get right across every place where you operate. Then there's like subcultures, like engineering culture is a little bit different from product culture, from operations culture, from customer support and so forth. But the big things need to be very similar across the company. Mm. Um, something I, I want to want to still still uh, touch during during this uh, fireside is uh, advice to European uh, founders. So um, what, how do you think you can build uh, being from a small small European country uh, into your advantage as a founder and, and, and when you are uh, thinking of, of expanding? Many things. Uh, for the 
for a long time, I think the big blocker we had was access to funding. And I see in Europe that has br broadly now been removed as an obstacle. You see companies in Europe coming up and raising hundreds of millions in the just first couple of years. So, so I think that is largely a, a solved problem. If you're a great entrepreneur, great business, great execution, like you can get access to the best investors in the world. So, so I think that's out of the way. Uh, so we need to play to our strengths. And I see oftentimes that is exactly combining these businesses that have a strong technology component with a strong offline operational component as well. Um, because oftentimes it's, that doesn't come very naturally to the Silicon Valley companies, but I think that's something that very much fits much more with this European frugal, more cost-efficient mindset, which that might not matter in some industries. Like if building Facebook or Google, like being cost-efficient doesn't matter at all. But if you're operating a, a business such as ours, a marketplace, then that's everything. Mm -hmm. If you're able to be 5-10% more efficient and then you scale that out, I mean, it starts to compound over time, that can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, and I mean, great companies, thanks to the internet, can come from anywhere. Anywhere where there's talent. And I think like it has never been a better time to come from virtually any place in the world to be able to build like a world-class company and a global company. So I think it's a great time to be an entrepreneur also in, also in Europe. And in, in our case, we started in a very small home market. So we made that into our advantage. Like our company culture, our company language is English, yet we operate in zero English-speaking markets. Like we had to build an international company from day one. And hence, we became very good at expansion. And I think you can turn this disadvantage to your advantage by virtue of the company that you built. Thank you so much, Miki and, and Marcus.